Today we're going to look at some of the biggest, baddest creatures in all of Magic by looking at the history of Magic's best reanimation targets. 1993 Sanger Vampire from Alpha the earliest years of magic are super weird. Alpha gave us Animate Dead, which is still considered to be one of the strongest reanimation spells of all time, even today. But in typical early magic fashion, the creatures of the era are pretty bad. There's not a ton of deck lists on the internet from the earliest days of magic, but the few early reanimation decks that do exist either don't play any reanimation targets at all and just used Animate Dead for value to reanimate whatever random creature happened to end up in the graveyard, or they topped their curve with Sanger Vampire. Technically, cards like Lord of the Pit and Mata Modijin existed at the time, but I couldn't find any examples of people actually reanimating them. So we'll stick with Sanger Vampire as the best reanimation target of the time, as weird as it seems, but don't worry, it wouldn't take long for real reanimation targets to come along. 1994, Nicole Bolas from Legends. The earliest true reanimation target is a villain that still shows up in magic sets today, although more often as a planeswalker than a creature in the Kobolas. The original Kobolas was an absurd card for its time. Not only was it a huge flyer, but if you connected with just a single attack, you would wrath away your opponent's entire hand. Of course, this came with a drawback that you needed to pay three mana on your upkeep or you'd have to sacrifice Nicole Bolas, which meant that cheating it into play on turn two wasn't really ideal because you wouldn't be able to pay the mana and have to sacrifice it. Although some early reanimation decks got around this by using Shallow Grave to reanimate Nicole Bolas with haste to wipe away their opponent's hand during the one turn it was on the battlefield. 1995, Deep Spawn from Fallen Empires. Fallen Empires is known to be one of the most underpowered sets in the whole history of Magic, although it didn't stop the set from unleashing one of the best reanimation targets of its time in Deep Spawn. Today, Deep Spawn looks kinda like a random, mostly unplayable common, but in 1995, a 6-6 Trampler that filled your graveyard and could gain Shroud until end of turn, even at the high cost of tapping yourself and not untapping the next turn, was super far above the curve. This led to it showing up in one of the earliest successful reanimator decks, a build by Alan Cormer, which looked to reanimate Deep Spawn, Nicole Bolas, and the equally hilariously bad Crimson Hellkite. While Deep Spawn might not be very good today, it is hilarious. It's about as close as you can get to reanimating Zoidberg in Magic, so eh, it's got that going for it at least. Did you see me escaping? I was all like. <laughs> Need a deep spawn of your own? Well, you can snag one from our awesome sponsor, Card Kingdom, over at cardkingdom.com slash mtggoldfish. 1997, Verdant Force from Tempest. Today, Verdant Force looks kind of like an intro pack rare, but back in 1997, an 8-mana 7-7 that made a 1-1 sapperling on each upkeep was one of the biggest, baddest finishers in all of Magic. Not only did it add a ton of power and toughness to the battlefield, but the sapperling tokens proved to be especially synergistic with one of the most popular reanimation spells of the time in Recurring Nightmare since you could sacrifice them to return more powerful creatures from your graveyard to the battlefield. 1999, Multani Marrow Sorcerer from Urza's Destiny. Today, reanimation targets are all upside, but that wasn't true 25 years ago when Multani Marrow Sorcerer was a go-to reanimation target. While the 6 drop is impossible to kill with targeted removal thanks to its shroud ability. Its size is variable. If both players have a lot of cards in hand, it can be massive, something like a 10-10 or even a 14-14. But if both players are empty-handed, Multani will literally die to its own ability. The good news is that by 1999, cards like Entomb and Exhum and Reanimate had been printed, greatly speeding up the reanimation plan, which made it possible to pretty consistently cheat Multani into play as early as turn two when both players had full hands, making it a huge threat. 2002 World Gorger Dragon from Judgment. World Gorger Dragon is a weird side note in the history of reanimation targets because it's really more of a combo piece than a pure reanimation target. If you use something like reanimate to cheat World Gorger Dragon into play, it's downright awful because when it enters the battlefield, it's going to exhale all the rest of your permanents, including your lands, and just a World Gorger Dragon is probably not going to be enough to win you the game. But players quickly realized if you reanimate World Gorger Dragon with animate dead, it would cause this weird loop where 
where World Warrior Dragon would enter the battlefield, and that would cause it to exile the Animate Dead. When Animate Dead leaves the battlefield, you gotta sacrifice the creature that it was enchanting, so you have to sacrifice the World Warrior Dragon, and then when World Warrior Dragon died, you'd get back all your permanents, including the Animate Dead, so it could reanimate the World Warrior Dragon again. So essentially, this loop would let you blink your entire battlefield an infinite number of times, including your lands, and you could tap your lands for mana in between this blinking loop, so it would generate infinite mana, and then you figure out how to win the game somehow. This combo actually led to World Gorger Dragon being banned in various formats over the years, although today there's just easier and less convoluted ways to win the game with reanimation, which keeps the dragon legal but mostly unplayed. 2003, a Chroma Angel of Wrath from Legions. Being a 6-6 flying hasty threat with protection from two of the most popular removal colors made a Chroma a popular reanimation target pretty much from the first day it was printed in Legions back in 2003. Although the game was about to enter the modern era and the power of top end threats was going to start snowballing quickly so it wouldn't take too long for a Chroma to be replaced. 2006, Tide Spell out Tyrant in Simic Sky Swallower from Dissension. Original Ravnica block dropped two new reanimation targets into Magic, both of which saw super heavy amounts of play, but for very different reasons. Simic Sky Swallower took the throne as the biggest, most evasive, hardest to kill creature to cheat into play as a 6 6 flying trampler with Shroud. Meanwhile, Tide Spout Tyrant was basically the original version of Hallbreak Horror, giving Reanimator decks a creature that could play defense, with the idea being you would reanimate Tide Spout Tyrant, cast a few cheap spells, bounce all of your opponent's permanents, including lands, and essentially lock your opponent out of playing the game. Also, honorable mention to Blazing Archon, which is also from Ravnica Block, a card that showed up in a lottery animator decks as a one-off as a way to stay alive for a few turns, is a big flying super-powered ghostly prison, keeping your opponent from being able to attack you. 2009, Inkwell Leviathan from Conflux. Simic Sky Swallower's Reign is the biggest evasive, unkillable threat to reanimate, lasted for about three years before Inkwell Leviathan came along. The combination of Island Walk and Trample made Inkwell Leviathan even more unblockable than the flying Simic Sky Swallower in a lot of matchups, and having seven power instead of six increased the clock by an entire turn, with Simic Sky Swallower taking four attacks to kill. While it took Inkwell Leviathan just three, so pretty much any reanimation deck that was playing Simic Sky Swallower <laughs> dropped it for the Leviathan. 2009, Iona Shield of Amiria from Zendikar. Later in 2009, Zendikar unleashed Iona Shield of Amiria into the multiverse, and it immediately became the most popular reanimation target in Magic, thanks to its combination of Hue's evasive stats and an incredibly powerful static ability. Being able to keep your opponent from casting spells of a specific color is super strong. It worse, you name whatever color you think your opponent might have a removal spell of that could kill Iona to keep Iona on the battlefield, at best you run into a monocolor deck and name whatever call your opponent's playing and straight up lock your opponent out of casting anything at all. 2012, Chrysalbrad from Avacyn Restored. While 2011's new Phyrexia unleashed the original Praetors on Magic, and both Elishnor and Jinkataxius saw some fringe play as reanimation targets, the new seminal moment in the history of reanimation was Grizzlebrand being printed in 2012's Avacyn Restored. While well, Grizzlebrand doesn't have any form of protection, so a single removal spell can take it down, it has something that's even better. The ability to draw 7 or even 14 cards as soon as it enters the battlefield. Toss in having a huge flying life linking body, and Grizzlebrand immediately pushed all the other reanimation targets in Magic to the sidelines. Sure, you might still play a copy of Iona or a Tidespout Tyrant as a one of for specific matchups, but Grizzlebrand would be the primary reanimation target moving forward for pretty much every reanimation deck in every format possible. 2021 
Archon of Cruelty from Modern Horizons 2. After the release of Grizzlebrand in 2012, not much changed in the world of reanimation targets for the next decade. Sure, occasionally Grizzlebrand decks would play a single Sire of Insanity as a secondary reanimation target on the theory that you could reanimate Grizzlebrand and then reanimate Sire of Insanity and make your opponent discard their hand so they couldn't deal with your board, and every once in a while someone would play a one of Ashen Rider as a removally reanimation target. But the reanimation targets people played in 2020 looked very much the same as the ones they played back in 2012 right after Grizzlebrand was printed. Grizzlebrand was so good that players started to wonder if another reanimation target would ever top it or if Grizzlebrand would just be the best thing to reanimate forever. But that all changed in 2021's Modern Horizons 2. I'm not sure it's fair to say that Archon of Cruelty is better than Grizzlebrand, but for the first time in a decade there was real competition for the reanimation throne thanks to the power of Archon of Cruelty's Enter the Battlefield trigger, which is something like a 4 for 1 making your opponent discard and lose life and sack creatures while you get to draw cards. It's absolutely absurd. In Legacy decks would simply play both Archon and Grizzlebrand, while in Modern, Archon of Cruelty would become the number one reanimation target because the most popular reanimation spell in the format, Persist, only reanimates non-legendary creatures so it can't cheat a Grizzlebrand into play. 2023 Atroxa Grand Unifier from Phyrexia All Will Be One. Finally, in 2023, the unthinkable happened. While Archon of Cruelty might arguably be as good as Grizzlebrand, just working in a very different way, in Phyrexia All Will Be One, Wizards finally printed a reanimation target that many players feel is straight up better than Grizzlebrand, an Atroxa Grand Unifier. In many ways, Atroxa does the same thing as Grizzlebrand, offering a massive flying lifelinking body that draws you a ton of cards, but unlike Grizzlebrand, you don't have to pay any life to draw the cards, with Atroxa, it just happens for free with its Enters the Battlefield ability. While players are still trying to figure out the exact right mix of reanimation targets now that Atroxa is around, some of the most popular recent reanimator decks are cutting back on Grizzlebrands to play four copies of Atroxa. The Phyrexian Angel's combination of a million keywords and a strong card advantage Enters the Battlefield ability is just that strong. Anyway, that is the history of reanimation targets in Magic the Gathering. If you want even more magic, make sure to check out the video where I throw a Yargle at my opponent's face in standard, or maybe the one where we rank every single win the game card in the game's history.